So this morning we are continuing our study of the book of Revelation. We are going to be covering chapter 18 today with a message I have entitled The Destruction of Economic Babylon. We have been talking a lot in this book about judgment. As a matter of fact, the majority of the book of Revelation concerns judgment. From the very beginning of chapter 6 all the way to the end of chapter 19, really you see nothing but judgment. Judgment upon a world that has shaken its fist in the face of God and said, we will have nothing for you. God says, oh really? We'll just see about that. What we're looking at here is the unfolding of the seven-sealed scroll. What we might call the title deed to the earth. And this scroll contains seven seals, and inside the seven seals are an unleashing of God's judgment. The seventh seal issues into seven trumpet judgments upon the earth. And this happens around the midway point of the tribulation period and continues toward the latter part of the three and a half years, at which time the seventh trumpet unleashes the seven bowl judgments. These are horrific, horrendous judgments that take place one right after the other. You would think that something like this would turn men's hearts toward God. In the face of all of these disasters, some which appear to be natural disasters, which are really things that God is doing to the earth through the angels who are inflicting this judgment. And some of it is uh, by man and his rebellion against God. What's interesting to note about this is this is really discussing the destruction of one's kingdom, that is Satan, who, who has been unleashed upon this earth, who took the scepter of rule from Adam, and his kingdom is being judged here in the book of Revelation. And what's interesting to note in reference to Satan's kingdom is that he knows he has only a short period of time as he works through both the Antichrist and the false prophet to go out and to deceive the nations, ultimately trying to get from them that which he has always wanted, namely to be worshipped. But because of man's hearts, man will also reject Satan. I mean, sure, he's doing Satan's bidding, but he doesn't want to worship Satan, which really is a source of a conflict that presents itself in one facet of judgment. Now, what we've been seeing in reference to this judgment, as it specifically rates, relates to Babylon is this, that chapter 17 and chapter 18 is really the destruction, what we see, the destruction of this city. Babylon means Babylon. We are first introduced to it in the book of Genesis when Nimrod, who was a wicked and evil king, decided to build a tower to reach up into the heavens to make themselves like the Most High. God confounded their languages and separated the nations based upon their languages. And along with this separation and spreading out over the face of the globe, went with people something that started in Babylon, namely pagan idolatry and idolatrous worship. That spread through the entire world. And so what we saw in Revelation 17 is really a recapitulation of everything that we see beginning from chapter 6 all the way up through and into chapter 18 and 19. But what we are seeing is the destruction of religious Babylon. We saw that last week in Revelation chapter 7. And that occurs in the first half of the uh, three and a half year tribulation mark. How do we know that? Because remember when Satan comes to power, according to Daniel chapter 9, he will issue out a... Uh, covenant with the nation of Israel where he will sign on to be their protector. 
that will offer some semblance of peace that will be based upon his control of military power, uh, which time he will allow the Jews to rebuild the temple if they, it is not already rebuilt at the time and institute the Old Testament worship. That will be only for a short season, for at the midway point he will stop sacrifices in the temple, he will place an idol in the, the temple, uh, declaring himself to be God, at which time the world will then rebel and reject him. Along with that, what will happen is that the kings of the world will then begin to go around and persecute anyone who's religious in terms of uh, if you were to think, for example, if you were the Antichrist and you're saying, okay, no one mess with Israel, you're free to worship whatever God that you want to. So uh, the Hindus in India can continue to do whatever they're doing and so uh, forth with uh, the Taoist in Japan and the Far East and so on. However, at that midway point, when he places the image of the idol in the temple, this uh, abomination which causes desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel and mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 24 he will stop all world rod religions and demand worship of himself uh, that will cause him to have to leave around the Jerusalem area and he will set up headquarters in a new Babylon now if we do look at Babylon today we know Saddam Hussein tried to rebuild it in the 90s uh, I mean, he did make some progress on rebuilding it, but as you know, um, he didn't get very far in terms of its completion. At some point in the future, that city will be restored and rebuilt and become the predominant capital city of the entire world. Uh, ancient Babylon, which again began in the book of Genesis, will find its ultimate fulfillment and ultimate destruction in Revelation chapter 18 when we see the destruction of economic Babylon. Last week was the destruction of religious Babylon. Chapter 18 is the destruction of economic Babylon. Now, just so that for those of you who might uh, be relatively new to the class, the way the book of Revelation breaks down is, is like this. In chapters 6 through chapter uh, 20, for the most part, what you're looking at is the seals, the trumpets, and the bull judgments. So you have the main action begin with the seals in chapter 6, and then there's an intermission. And we said that this intermission is where the writer sometimes will look at the things that are occurring in the present for him, or perhaps things in the past, or perhaps things again in the future. Or perhaps he might even be recapitulating, that is telling the story again of everything that had transpired, but maybe from a different perspective. And so that's our first intermission, the sixth and the seventh seals, that is the break in between the two. Then the action returns in Revelation chapter 8 and 9. Then you have an intermission again between the sixth and seven trumpets, that's chapters 10 through 15. The main action again returns in chapter 16 with the pouring out of the seven bowls of God's wrath. Now with our final intermission here, chapter 17 and 18, as John describes for us the destruction of religious Babylon, chapter 17, and then the destruction of economic Babylon, chapter 18. What's the good news? The good news is as we begin our next chapter, which we'll do next time, we will not be talking about judgment so much anymore. We will be talking about celebration and the heavenly hallelujahs. Why? because Jesus Christ is soon to make His return to this earth to set up His kingdom in righteousness. Amen. And for that we say a hearty Amen. So what exactly is Revelation chapter 18 talking about? Well, MacArthur puts it this way. He says, God's judgment will rain down on the earth in the form of the seal, trumpet, and bold judgments. They will focus particularly on Antichrist's world empire of Babylon, the Babylon in view in chapter 18 is Antichrist's uh, worldwide commercial empire, which will rule the world during the last three and a half years of the tribulation. That Antichrist will be able to build the greatest commercial empire the world has ever known in the midst of the devastating judgments of the tribulation reveals his incredible power. What, he's, what his goal is is something that we see in our own culture today. And it was something that happened somewhere around the 20th century where would you begin to see a merging between big business and government. 
Now, if I would have said that 10 years ago, people would be looking at me like, I'm, I'm not quite sure about that one. But in 2021, do we need to ask that question if there's a link between big business and government, big tech, big pharma, big EVA, as they're commonly known, between that and the government? There most certainly is. There is a diabolical plan that we see being set forth now, which is laying the groundwork ultimately for the Antichrist and his rule. So let's consider the destruction of economic Babylon. These are going to be 24 verses. I have it seg separated down into three sections. We see in verses 1 through 8, the reason for God's judgment. In verses 9 through 20, the recompense of God's judgment. And then in verses 21 through 24, the results of God's judgment. So, why is God judging Babylon here? That is, economic ba Babylon. Well, he tells us, that is, John tells us, who is the author of the book of Revelation, it is because of their spiritual idolatry and immorality. Look at verse 1. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of her wine, of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. So what we see here then is that this judgment that is coming, this judgment is announced by a strong angel. And the judgment is coming upon economic Babylon because Babylon, working in conjunction with the ten kings and the other various uh, rulers who will be operating at the time, is guilty of rebellion and sin against God. And this is all spearheaded by the almighty dollar generated by spiritual and economic Babylon, that is the literal physical city. Even in the midst of the great tribulation that we've talked about, the earthquakes, the floods, the scorching heat, the wind not blowing, asteroids hitting the earth causing great devastation, demon possession on a national and international scale. But even in the midst of all of this, men will still try to find a way to make a buck. MacArthur notes, the Antichrist evil religious and commercial empire will spread its hellish influence to all the nations of the world. Having drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, the people of the world will fall into a religious and materialistic stupor. Babylon will seduce the entire world. The unregenerate people of the world will lust for Babylon. The merchants of the earth will have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. In the beginning, the world will cash in on Babylon's financial prosperity. What motivates them? The almighty dollar. Their idolatry and immorality. That's one of the reasons for judgment. Another reason for judgment is because of God's sovereign purposes. God's sovereign purposes. What we're talking about is He's giving the saints, as He has done many, many times in example through Scripture, a chance for the saints to escape judgment. Look at verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Presumably this is God speaking. Apparently there are going to be saints, that is, people who regenerated, who are in Babylon for whatever reason. But God is telling them, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. And commenting upon this, Henry Morris, in his commentary over Revelation, writes this, in reference to these believers who are in this city. He said, The special warning to believers in Babylon is poignantly appropriate. It is in the capital city that the deadly decree of the false prophet will undoubtedly be imposed first of all and most severely of all, uh, that is, to punish those believers who do not take the mark of the beast. 
even if believers residing in Babylon should somehow escape the purges of the beast, they would still be affected by the awful plagues that are coming on Babylon. Thus the Lord's urgent warning to believers to flee Babylon. The, the world at that time is going to hate them, much as it hates us today. But don't be deceived, beloved. As you look around at the world today, remember this, that we as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we as individual believers in the church are the target of Satan and his cohorts. Uh, there is going to come a time where church as we see and experience it and have known it will stop. The world is not going to allow that. Sure, the world follows a Jesus. They follow a Jesus that's based upon compassion, love, and tolerance. But that is not the Jesus of the Bible who demands holiness, who demands us to love our enemies. The problem is, is that when the world and their conception of Jesus comes up against the biblical conception of Jesus, they will persecute the church. They're not going to persecute you because you're a follower of Christ. They're going to persecute you because they're going to call you a bigot. Someone who's immovable and stubborn in their beliefs. Someone that cannot be retrained. That's the way they're going to come at us. Don't think so? Look at the way they've took, taken our children. It starts in school, an indoctrination process. And it continues on through college and the universities with more of an indoctrination process, which is why now most evangelical children, when they leave high school and go to college, roughly 70% of them do not return. Why? Because we fed them directly into the mouths of Satan. That's where we are. Now think about that type of persecution being increased. Not passive, but actively pursuing us. That time is coming. That's not my word. Jesus said that in reference to judgment, uh, experiencing the world's judgment. He says, These things I have spoken to you, that you may be kept from stumbling, that will make you outcast from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. Why? Because we got, we got rid of those closed-minded, bigoted, hateful Christians. That's where we're headed. However, the church may take a beating, so to speak, momentarily. But part of God's sovereign purposes and plan is that He will ultimately vindicate Himself and He will vindicate the church. How? By punishing its tormentors, the sinners. Notice verse 6 of chapter 18. Pay her back even as she has been paid. Here he's talking about Babylon. Babylon is viewed as the prostitute that the whole world has some type of relationship with. The angel says, pay her back even as she is paid and give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, tw mixed twice as much for her, to the degree that she has glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I am not a widow, and I will never see mourning, such as man's ideas. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong. MacArthur notes, Babylon's judgment is defined as the angel now speaks not to John, but to God. His call for vengeance on Babylon is based on the Old Testament principle of lex talionis, which is the law of retaliation, something that the Old Testament is based upon, that is the law of Moses. It's the principle of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Babylon has been extended enough grace and heard enough warnings. It is time for vengeance. It is time for her destruction. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves as we look at this, and as sometimes we are asked to explain, how could a loving God do these types of things? 
then we have to take the whole picture into consideration. It is just and fair to be paid back double for Babylon's sin. So the answer to the, the answer to the question is yes. Consider what Moses write in Exodus 22. If someone steals an ox or a donkey or a sheep and it is found in the thief's possession, then the thief must pay double the value of the stolen animal. Why? Because that's right. That's just. That's fair. Suppose someone leaves money or goods with a neighbor for safekeeping and they are stolen from the neighbor's house. If the thief is caught, the compensation is double the value of what was stolen. Why? Because that is right. That is just. That is good. The notion of penance today is let's not take offenders and make them pay back to society and individuals what they owe. Let's send them to TDC so they can watch TV and hang out and learn how to become better criminals. Restitution is the biblical model. Repentance and restitution. Exodus 22, Moses writes, Suppose there is a dispute between two people who both claim to own a particular ox, donkey, sheep, article of clothing, or any lost property. In other words, what he's saying is, whatever it is doesn't really matter, but let's look at the principle. Both parties must come before God, and the person to whom God declares guilty, watch this, must pay double compensation to the other. Israel, uh, on the other hand, uh, paid double for her sins. So here we're looking at individuals, now we're looking at nations. What is God's view of that? Isaiah chapter 40, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and that her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Jeremiah 16, I am watching them closely. And I see every sin, says God. They cannot hope to hide from me. I will double their punishment for all their sins. Reason? Because they have defiled my land with lifeless images to their detestable gods, and they have filled my territory with their evil deeds, idolatry and immorality. Now, what's interesting about that is something that Pastor Hampton Keithley noted in his commentary on Revelation. Look at what he says here. He says, here's an important lesson. Commercial Babylon, with its worship of money and power, will promote and push unrestrained luxury, sensuality, and pleasure designed to develop an all-consuming power over the masses via their uncontrolled lust patterns. Babylon will promote the philosophy that happiness, significance, security, and fulfillment are attained by the abundance of the things people possess in travel and luxury and comfort and pleasure. Frankly, he says, this sounds exactly like America today and much of the world. He's nailed it 110%. That's where we are as a society. Everything we do is, for the most part, done so that the senses can be gratified. That's what it means, by the way, to be sensual, that you do things in life with an orientation so that the senses may be gratified. What do I mean by that? You do things that are pleasing to the eye, pleasing to the ear, pleasing to the nose, the taste. Unbelievers, this is all they're driven by. That's why when you talk to an unbeliever, uh, and a lot of times they're going to mask where they are spiritually, and they're only going to want to engage in frivolous or light conversation. But if you talk to an unbeliever, that's what dominates their thinking. When you wake up with them, hey, what are we doing today? Let's do something fun. Why? It gratifies the senses. Where are we going to go eat lunch? Why? Because that's what gratifies the senses. No sooner, within five minutes, are you done eating lunch than they start talking about where we eat and dinner. Why? Because that's what gratifies the senses. You say, wow, I wonder if that's really true. Well, Thanksgiving's coming up. Try it on your ne- uh, fr- friends and neighbors and family. Just talk to them as a little experiment and see where they are, what drives their motives in conversation. Babylon's final destruction was revealed to some of the Old Testament prophets. This is not something that's new with John. This is actually something that was told of in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 13, for example, Isaiah writes this in reference to the destruction of Babylon. 
He says, scream in terror for the day of the Lord has arrived and the time for the Almighty to destroy. Every arm is paralyzed with fear. Every heart melts. The people are terrified. Pangs of anguish grip them like those of a woman in labor. They look helplessly at one another. Their faces aflame with fear, for they see the day of the Lord is coming, the terrible day of His fury and fierce anger. And the land will be made desolate, and all the sinners destroyed with it. The heavens will be black above them, the stars will give no light, the sun will be dark when it rises, the moon will provide no light. Very reminiscent of what Jesus said in Matthew 24 in reference to His Olivet Discourse. The sun will be dark when it rises. The moon will provide no light. I, the Lord, will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their sin. I will crush the arrogance of the proud and humble the pride of the mighty. I will make people scarcer than gold, more rare than fine gold or opir. For I will shake the heavens. The earth will move from its place when the Lord of heaven's armies displays the wrath in the day of his fierce anger. Wow, God has a serious attitude toward Babylon, does He not? They are bent on destruction. Jeremiah 50, another Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah says this. He says, A drought will strike Babylon's water supply, causing it to dry up. Again, that goes back to one of the judgments of the drying up of the Euphrates River, allowing the armies from the east to come over to participate in the Battle of Armageddon. And why, Jeremiah asked, because the whole land is filled with idols. And the people are madly in love with them. Soon Babylon will be inhabited by desert animals and hyenas. Its home will be the home of the owls. Never again will people live there. It will lie desolate forever. I will destroy it as I destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And they still don't know where those those cities are. And their neighboring towns, says the Lord. No one will live there. No one will inhabit it. That is, after God judges, judges it. So, let's look at the recompense. What exactly is God going to judge? Now, notice, people are going to weep over Babylon's destruction. Now, he mentions two different groups of people. The first he mentions are kings. Presumably, these are the kings of the Ten Nation Confederation, spearheaded that sole purpose is to carry out the will of the Antichrist. And the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensually with her, that is, with Babylon's desires, wants, the things that, that the city could provide, these will le- weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment is come. MacArthur notes that the destruction of the seat of the Antichrist political and economic power, which is the city of Babylon, will strike a fatal blow to his empire. The fall of Babylon will be a symbol of the fall of the entire evil world system. And the kings will feel that effect immediately. Another group that feels that effect are the merchants. Big Pharma, Big Tech, Big Eva. The merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her. Because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spices and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep. Man, he's listing off everything that there is. All the pleasantries of life. And notice this. For everybody who's bent today on social justice, how they look, uh, for example, and and I will say this, that the the experimentation, uh, uh, or what they call the American experiment in reference to uh, slavery, was a horrific thing that was practiced in this uh, country. And praise the Lord that it doesn't exist today. But for those who think that is the most heinous sin that has ever been committed, that is going to go on worldwide in the future. Look at the commodities. He's mentioned all of these various commodities, but he doesn't start, stop with things. He even includes people. He says, 
and cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves and human lives. What's he talking about here? He's talking about forced, forced labor. It costs a, run, a lot to run an empire. And much of that labor is going to consist of people who don't necessarily want to be there doing it. But they will be forced to do it. Perhaps many of these will be those who put their faith and trust in Christ during the time of the tribulation period. Those who become Christians during that time. Perhaps these are they who will become slaves in that period. He says, the fruit you long for has gone from you, and all the things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you, and men will no longer find them. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning and saying, Woe, woe, the great city. She who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste, and every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? What they're looking at here is the destruction of, of their means. If Babylon is the only city in the entire world through which commerce is being exchanged, that means everyone's life, in terms of just how they are living and making a living, is dependent upon Babylon. Now that city is leaving. When I read this, I'm reminded of those who I see sometimes on the news. Perhaps you've seen them as well either during the floods or during great fires. You always see the person on the news standing in front of their destroyed home and they're weeping and they're saying, my life is gone. My life is gone. But that's not really true, is it? What did Jesus say? Life does not consist in the abundance of things. But for the world who doesn't know any better, their, their life is their things. And as a result, they threw dust on their heads and they were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been laid waste. It's almost hard not to feel sorry for these folks, is it not? But the thing we must remember, though, is that their punishment is just. If you question that, consider this. Sheriff? Yes, sir. You the boy's father? That's right. Simon Winkler. Andy Taylor. Now then, what's this all about? 249A, section Roman numeral 5. <laughs> Passenger carrying wheel vehicle, making passage, and or transcending area designated for pedestrian traffic only. Suspect duly <laughs> warned, flaunted said warning, and ignoring same repeated offense within a 24-hour period. All right, so he rode his bike on the sidewalk. I was there, Mr. Winkler. Arnold was given a warning and continued to ride his bicycle on the sidewalk. Everybody's against me! Oh, there, there, son. Can't even have a little fun. The law's the law, Mr. Winkler. Now, if we don't teach children to live in society today, what's going to happen to them when they grow up? For heaven's sake, Sheriff, the boy's not a criminal. I didn't say he was. Now, what he does at home is none of our business. But when he gets out on the street, he's going to have to answer to us. I can show you in the statute book. The minimum punishment for this offense is impounding the bicycle for one week. Well, you can't do it. I demand you return that bike and now. Now, you look here. You're that boy's father. You're responsible for his actions. Now, he's too young to be locked up. But if you're not going to take responsibility, maybe I ought to lock you up. You ever think of that? Yeah. Well, my dad ain't scared of that, are you? Make them put you in jail. That'll show him. Go on, Dad. Show them they can't push me around. Go on. Put him in jail. He won't care. How's that? My dad'll show you. He's tough. You, uh, you want me to lock your father up? He ain't afraid of you. I don't want to lose my brand new bike. I just got it. You'd rather I put your father in jail? I want my bike! <laughs> Sheriff? 
Sheriff, there won't be any need to impound that bike. How's that? I'd like to have it. I want to sell it. Sell it? You're going to sell my bike? That's right, Arnold. But it's my bike. You can't sell my bike. Be quiet, Arnold. <laughs> Barney, you won't go get the bicycle. Ten four. No, 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 no. I won't let you. You can't do that. Arnold, be quiet. <laughs> Mr. Winkler, would you like to continue this father and son discussion in quiet? Huh? I say, would you like to continue this in quiet? There's a real nice woodshed out back. Woodshed? Mm-hmm. Good old-fashioned woodshed? Real nice one. Mm hmm? Come on, Arnold. Think he deserves it? I don't want to say. After all, he is one of my own kind. <laughs> and that's when I read through Revelation and I saw the anguish on here, on, on these, these people as they see everything gone, everything taken from them. And, I, and as I was doing the study, I, I almost felt sorry for them. Much like Opie said there, I don't want to say anything. I mean, after all, they're kind of one of my own kind. But they are the ones who put their fist in the face of God and they tell him, I want my bike. We will not have you ruling over us. What's interesting to note is the only ones who rejoice at this great destruction are the saints. Notice this. It's not just the saints who are on the earth. Revelation 18, 20, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, the very foundation of the church, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. MacArthur notes, The long-awaited moment of vindication and vengeance for which the martyred tribulation believers prayed, remember back from chapter 6, will have arrived. Heaven rejoices not over the damnation of sinners, but because of the triumph of the righteous, the exaltation of Jesus Christ and the elimination of His enemies, and the arrival of His kingdom on the earth. So how then does Babylon finish? How does God do it? We see that in verses 21 through 24. Babylon's destruction is complete, meaning it is utter. Then the strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with the violence and will not be found any longer. Reminiscent of what Jesus said about those who cause the little ones to stumble, it would be better if they had a millstone tied around their neck and cast into the sea rather than to make one of these little ones stumble. And the sound of the harpist and the musicians and flute players and trumpeters and will not be heard any longer, and no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer, and the sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer." And the light of the lamp will not shine in you any longer, and the voice of the bridegroom and bride will no longer be heard in you any longer, for your merchants were the great men of the earth. So Babylon in its destruction will be destroyed by two ways or two means. First, it's going to be by heaven's angels. The seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and the cloud and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake, such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty, the great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. So the angel, as he is unleashing the judgment upon the earth, this judgment comes in the form of an earthquake that destroys the city. But it's not just a natural type of disaster 
that occurs to Babylon. But Babylon is also destroyed by heaven's angel and also by human armies. Jeremiah 50 foretells this, for he says... Behold, I am stirring up and bringing against Babylon a gathering of great nations from the north country. And they shall array themselves against her. Behold, a people comes from the north, a mighty nation, and many kings are stirring from the farthest parts of the earth. Remember what I told you before, even though Satan wants to be worshipped, and the Antichrist makes it so that everyone must worship him, man is rebellious against God, but he's also going to be rebellious against the Antichrist, which is going to cause some type of guerrilla kind of warfare uh, to be occurring when these people from the north, probably Russia, uh, will come down and enter into an armed conflict with the city of Babylon. Notice what Jeremiah writes. Uh, the people come from the north in a mighty nation, and many kings are stirring from the farthest parts of the earth. They lay hold of the bow and spear, and they are cruel and have no mercy. The sound of them is like the roaring of the sea. They ride on horses, arrayed as a man for a battle against you, O daughter of Babylon. Dr. Ron Rhodes, who is a prophecy scholar, Uh, writes this in reference to that destruction. He says, Just as God used the Babylonians in the Old Testament times as His rod of judgment against Israel, so now God uses a northern coalition as His whipping rod against Babylon. Just as Babylon showed no mercy in its oppression of Israel, so God will show no mercy to Babylon. It will be utterly destroyed. So, How and why is Babylon's judgment consistent with the nature and character of God? He answers that question as well. We see that in the latter part of verse 23. Because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and all who have been slain on the earth. In other words, they are guilty of murdering the saints. Murdering the saints. So what are some of the things we can take away from this in closing? Just a couple. The first is stay confident. Look at the world around you. Look at what's going on today. And those of you who are retired and, and uh, so forth and have your eyes glued to CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and that kind of thing, you're going to be inundated with bad news from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. So don't watch it all the time, right? But if you get involved in looking at the world's problems from the world's perspectives, it's easy to lose confidence. But don't place your confidence in them. Place it in this book and in the God of this book. Though wickedness seems to prevail at the present time, there is coming a day of judgment and reckoning. As such, Christians can take great comfort in knowing that God will make all things right in the end. So be patient. God's still working on this world. Secondly, stay committed. Don't be unwise in your Christian walk and be swept away by the influences of the world, which is easy to do. Stick to it. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because we do not know when we will give an account before God. Jesus said it this way. He said, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his soul will lose it. But whoever loses his soul for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What Jesus is saying here, you'll notice that some of the translators say life, and then a little bit later on he says soul. It's the same Greek word, suke. It's where we get our English word soul, also where we get our English word psychology. Psychology. What he's saying here is that there is an exchange between the soul and the reward of the afterlife, whether it be heaven or hell. There's going to be an exchange made. He says, The Son of Man is going to come in the glory of His Father with His angels and then will repay every man according to his deeds. So my question to you is, what is it that you are going to exchange? What is the product of your life worth? Jesus answered that question 
in Luke chapter 12 in the form of a parable. He said, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store up my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Suke, there's our word, Soul, you have many goods laid up for years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool! I mean, he just described the American lifestyle, the American dream, right? Work hard when you're young, retire, and don't do anything. Don't go serve the church. Don't be around God's people. Don't care about your neighbor. Just do whatever you want to do. God says a person who has an uh, attitude like that, you fool. This very night your suke, soul, is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man, Jesus said, who stores up for himself treasure and is not rich toward God. The soul then must be understood this way, because again, this is what you will exchange. The soul is the total sum of the inner person. It is the summation of the mind, the will, the intellect, the heart. It is that immaterial facet of man that animates the flesh. The product of your soul, that is your thoughts, your words, your actions is that which will be evaluated before God, either at the Bema judgment or the great right throne judgment. The question is, are you ready? It's not a matter of if you will stand at the judgment. It's a matter of when you will stand at the judgment. <clears throat> As Paul notes, we must all appear before the Bema, that is believers of Christ, so that each one may be paid back the word there is to be paid back what is due, to be recompensed according to what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So hang in there, press on, finish the course, Amen. set the race, Amen. win the race. You don't have to do it on your own power because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. He's already won the race before you. And your success is guaranteed. All you have to do is reach out and take it.